Welcome back to the Get Your Life Back Summit. Right now, I have the honor of welcoming David Brower, and I'm just going to read you a little bit of his introduction. You can take the boy out of Hollywood, but you can't take Hollywood out of the boy. David grew up in Los Angeles, jumped on a plane at 22 to Paris with a one-way ticket. After 20 years in the wild international movie biz, Disney and IMAX, David evolved in Paris, France in 2013 from the vicarious popcorn screen experience of life to a more visceral, personal, real life transformational life experience of really living. In 2015, he created his live sensorial experience events. And in 2016, he founded the Alivefulness Movement, a sensory and human connection live experience like no other. His empowering work is about loving life, opening up to all the world has to offer. So David, thank you so much for joining us this evening from France. I really appreciate your being here. My pleasure, Beth. This is going to be great. Hello, okay. everyone. Okay. All right. We're excited <laughs> to have you here. This is a conversation I particularly wanted to have because you talk in your work all the time about loving the life you live and living the life you love. Mm. So what does that mean to you? And why is, what, how is that important in the work that you do? Well, isn't that everything? Don't we all want to love the life that we live and, and consequently live the life that we love? And it all starts with this awareness, the attention to that you actually are living a, a life that you, that you enjoy. So getting more aware and present to actually what's going around you, who's in your life, uh, where you live, what's the environment, what are the the, the foods that you're eating, what are the places that you're going to? Uh, how, do you how do you spend your, your life? We've, we've kind of pulled out of uh, sort of the HD mode, I would call it, to kind of zoom in and actually really appreciate uh, with a little more attention what exactly we're living, this beautiful life, the places that, that we can go, the beautiful foods that we can eat, the people that are so magnificent around us. And, you know, of course, the work that we do, the work that we're bringing into the world. And so it's just firstly really about just noticing, like, what's really going great in my life? What am I, like, pretty darn happy about? Let's celebrate that already. And let's remind ourselves of that constantly. Let's get into a habitual, um, iterative reminder mindset, heart set, soul set, all these different layers to actually get to a level of, you know, every day waking up and knowing that we have a lot of things that are going so amazing for us. We, mu we must be so grateful for this and to bring this more into, you know, a mood of feeling, a visualization, uh, to really reconnect with that and not just go from like one thing to the next, like more, more, what's next? You know, not appreciating it, not celebrating really the little wins and um, not really appreciating the people that are around us in, in a way that, that can be felt, that can be something that can be acknowledged and expressed and shared. And there's so much richness and abundance already in a, a lot of our lives uh, that, you know, if we can focus more on that, we start to already feel really buoyant and resilient and rich and wealthy. That's and all these beautiful. things that, that everyone reads about and wants to experience, well, already, it's already, a lot of it is already kind of there. It's just, can we really not sharpen our senses to be able to uh, appreciate it. So that's sort of the side of, you know, uh, loving the life that you, you live. Now, obviously, there are things that are not working. There are things you're not, you don't know, feel good about. You're not in maybe the right relationship, not in the right um, job or position. You're not pursuing the activities that bring you pleasure. You're kind of constantly in obligation. You're saying yes to all of these uh, outings that you're really not getting much, you know, human connection out of or value or, or feeling or growth or expansion or, you know, they're not very fun or entertaining, or maybe it's a little bit too much cheap entertainment. It's like cotton, too much cotton candy, uh, too much uh, junk movies, too much uh, bad reading, too much these kinds of things. So, you know, as we go through this, it's like, what are you loving about your life and what can you appreciate? The other side is really, or maybe there are some shifts in decisions, perspectives, choices that I need to make to be able to actually live more of the life that I love. And, and you got to really know what, 
what motivates you, what you get pleasure out of in life and really get that out. So you get really clear. Once you start getting more clear about this and you're testing things and experimenting, you know, for me, it's like walking down uh, a street and not looking at the stores that sell things that I don't care about, you know? <laughs> or it's like walking by a newsstand to see all of this crazy um, public people fantasy press, uh, junk food press. I don't even, you know, I've trained myself not even to look at this when I walk by. I'm not getting pleasure for them. I get more pleasure in my mind, in my heart, looking at the people walking around, looking at the blue sky, appreciating again, it's back to this like living in the moment, leaning on your senses kind of sensation. So that's sort of the two sides of the uh, of life as I've, I experience it and, and want to experience it. That is beautiful. In my work, one of the things that we've noticed is that there's this tremendous encouragement for people to narrow down, to drop mm. over the side, is what I like to say, what isn't absolutely necessary to getting the thing done now. To And people make a, a great virtue, and it is a virtue, of of focusing really, really hard. And what I have found also is that people lose enjoyment. They lose the capacity to keep in what really matters, what keeps them resilient and buoyant. So mm -hmm. you talk about self-mastery in that context. And I'm wondering if you can bring that in and give us that piece as well. Surely. Uh, <laughs> you know, there, there's a limit to optimization. There's a limit to streamlining. You know, mm -hmm. There's a, a limit to utilitarian uh, eating. You know, there's a limit to op, you know, efficiency. Uh, all of these things at some point related to things that make life worth living can be kind of a dead end road, can be kind of a damper on our experience of life. I mean, food is the greatest example of this for me and, and is a key central... Uh, it's really probably that and people are the are really my keystone lifestyle habits uh, you know with food uh, if all you're going for is the fastest thing uh, the get in and out you know just feed my body nutrients and even that is questionable I'm not so sure so many people are good at that yeah when they get utilitarian uh, you know you you start to get into a, a a habit of making something truly not important something truly not a ritual, something truly you're not honoring, something truly not pleasurable, something not joyful, not perhaps too tasty, not perhaps even too healthy, I would say, in, in some cases. So this, this desire to, uh, to maybe go for convenience and speed and, you know, this sensation that it's not worth it enough, there's not enough value, there's not enough ROI Am I spending the time, money, resources, effort to maybe learn to choose better food choices, to go the extra 10 minutes by car to go to my favorite place, uh, you know, to spend a little bit more time with friends around the table. You know, this sort of downside, uh, I already call it, it's kind of, you know, whatever, like pause or holiday or break. Remember the word breakfast, lunch break? You know, these things, uh, they're intended to actually be a break. If you stay in the same mindset through breaks like this, uh, you become kind of like a machine and you, you know, you come to a point where you probably don't even know how to turn it off. You probably don't know actually in some ways, and I'm not, I'm not being judgmental at all to anybody, but we kind of we train ourselves to go through things without really experiencing them. And we're so caught up in here, maybe we're like eating at our desk or we're walking while we're eating or you know, we're doing it alone uh, or we're just not getting the pleasure out of it. And for me, the whole difference in life is finding that, um, that crossroads between something that's utilitarian perhaps but that's super pleasurable. So, and that's why I really started to learn to cook uh, as much as I could, because I said, if I'm going to be able to cook amazingly uh, uh, and make it like, you know, better than going out, um, I've got to get the skill set. 
I've got to learn. I've got to spend the hours. I've got to put in the time. And also, I've got to find or why this is pleasurable. Why do, how can I make this actually enjoyable for myself uh, so that it's not just something I want to race through. I'm actually getting value of it. It's like a meditation for me. It's a creative moment. It's a connection with myself moment. I mean, cooking gets such a bad rap. You know, it's like, why is meditation alone sitting there, you know, in silence, valuable, but like cooking something gorgeous with ingredients that you've sourced amazingly, you've spoken to the person who sold it to you, and you, you know where it comes from, and you've you spent some time to buy with a little bit of knowledge, and you've learned more, and you've questioned, and you're connected to the planet, and you bring that together with other things, and either you follow a recipe or you don't, and you create something, you transform something and you all of your senses are involved in cooking and it gets you out of your head and you have this creative moment this creation moment and you know what you know you got to be present because you got this sharp knife right <laughs> and you know little by little you suddenly reason there's an artisanal feeling that gets you out of your head gets you into a a flow state and if it's a moment of creating something that's to to nourish yourself this is like the first step in Self-love, so doing something that's only utilitarian, only to get it done, um, that's only, you know, like the shake that has all that you need to make it healthy. You know, I think I look pretty healthy. I'm coming uh, up, this is my 50th year. And, you know, I think I'm doing okay. And I'm not, you know, I'm not following any regime, if anything, maybe a Mediterranean, Mediterranean <laughs> regime, uh, you know, but I drink wine almost every day. Uh, and, you know, I have moments of abuse and of, you know, eating too much, drinking too much, and, and things kind of go up and down, but more or less, uh, my system is super trained to come back to a natural state and stuff. And overall, I mean, um, I guess I've been gifted to come to, to Europe, particularly France, where there is a culture around um, creating a pleasurable moments of connection and appreciation for, the, you know, the finer things of, of life, of which food can be uh, if you choose it and not in a way that's you know overly rich and unhealthy nor i would say uh overly expensive so i'm really just trying to find that that crossroads there uh between it you don't have to spend a lot of money to eat amazingly well particularly if you know how to cook and you know how to buy and if you put love into it i mean think about this movie like water for chocolate have you seen this movie Beth? i love like water is for chocolate like the, it's such is a great that like the greatest movie yes so you're like you know she's like that one, and chocolate, chocolate, both of them yeah and chocolat exactly yeah. and, and babette's feast and uh -huh. i mean cooking movies are are crazy uh, moments for me if, if anyone hasn't seen these movies you know this is a great way to initiate yourself to how can there be more pleasure in there now of course you've got to learn to to about food some more and there's lots of you know ways to to do that uh, but i think constantly going for the shortcut the hack and if it doesn't work to just discard it for things that are part of our primary activities in life which again one of them is eating uh, uh and spending time with people around a table and, and nourishing ourselves uh, if that's not a central point i think that we've lost uh, we've kind of lost the focus. We're kind of focusing on the hole and not the donut. And this is a super enriching way to live a way more pleasurable life. And in the end, I mean, it gives you a tremendous amount of vitality to, to also know that you can nourish yourself and you know what's best. So you don't need to watch all this stuff that's you know, out there that's uh, telling you to buy this or this kind of product. You start to learn more about what, you're, what you really enjoy and what you need uh, for yourself to, to live in vitality, to live with vibrance, to live in a lifefulness. <laughs> <laughs> so it sounds to me very much as if, you know, I'm, sh I'm sure you'd be all about a wonderful vacation to a great place, but you're really, in my understanding, talking about enjoying the moment of being in whatever is happening for you now and having a full body experience of it, to feel it as well as think it. Is that, is that a fair way to say what you're saying or am I missing something? No, there's that, that's a lot part of it, Beth, in the sense that, you know, I'm trying to get myself out of my head and when I'm doing it and I'm sharing these moments with people, wherever it is, it doesn't have to be around a dining table. 
it could be right here. I mean, you know, this is a pleasurable moment and a meaningful moment, you know, and a moment that has value and depth and, and there's something that's there. And so for me, it's like in every moment of my life, I want to be that meaning maker and I want to be a leader in uh, creating meaning in the moments that I share with people when, let's say, the, the energy is not there. Uh, it's like people reserve this great energy when they're with their friends in their home and then they come and they, we do work together and they're like, I'm like, who is this person? <laughs> you know? Who is this vanilla ice cream? What, what happened to the whole rainbow of uh, flavors? And so I'm, I'm not constantly trying to trigger people to snap out of it and like, relax. We're going we're gonna to perform. We're going to ultra perform. We'll probably even better perform together if we actually get some pleasure out of it, don't you think? Mm-hmm. I certainly think so. So my thing is really shaking that up in, in all the aspects uh, of my life. Because again, this, this moment of pleasure for me and a relationship of pleasure gets you into really a state of flow and deeper connection and caring. And this is when, you know, laughter comes out and the emotions come out and deeper sharing comes out and, and trust actually can even come out, you know, granted it's done in a way that's, you know, authentic. I'm certainly like, you know, I'm like the court jester guy, right? It kind of shows up and it's like, it's like, what's, what's the next trick I can do? How can I get you to break a smile? You know, so you loosen up so I can loosen up, right? I'm looking at you. There's this mirror neuron thing going on. Like, can you loosen up so I can loosen up? I mean, there's like all this kind of stuff going on. So I'm really trying to change the energy in the spaces that I go to and find the people in the group to do that and, and recognize kind of what there is coming out of everyone. I love, uh, I love to try and tap into that so that it's like sitting around a dinner table. For me, it's like everyone should get a moment to, to shine. No one should be dominating what's happening around a table. And, and there's a whole art to kind of doing that. And same in a work situation, in meetings or with friends, and there's kind of these things going on, you know, to kind of find the energy that everyone feels like they actually belong. You know, people are suffering so much not to be seen today, not to be heard, not to have their moment to, to contribute and shine. And, and particularly like that thing that really makes them so special and, a, and amazing or that, you know, maybe that, that sense of humor, but they need this space maybe to do it, they need to be pointed at and say, hey, you, come out, come out and play, come out and play. So I'm, yeah, I'm constantly looking to trigger that. And if the meaning is not there, I'm trying to really shake things up. I mean, gosh, I went to a meeting yesterday with a bunch of, bunch of people and the energy was, was pretty low. And some lady leaned over to me and she said, my God, this is serious and boring. You know, yep. <laughs> so and there were smart things going on there's the interesting people you know but the energy was just kind of not there and it does come down a bit to this body language of opening up and connecting and you know uh, um you know t- touching people with our uh, you know uh, on, on, the, on the shoulder the hand or you know and recognizing people and complimenting people generously and creating a flow of kind of energy we're always kind of like you know, so I'm really into opening up that real human connection in every contest. And even when I go to the shopping, I'll be doing this, like the cashier. Like, how can I make this person's day? What's the little joke, the little thing I'm going to say, you know, wow, it's 1130 and I'm buying champagne here. It's Friday night and you're working at 1130. I'm like, I'm like, you're amazing. I love you. This is just <laughs> like, do you know how much happiness you're giving to people who are coming through here today? You know, to give something to the world like this, everywhere, there's so many touch points. Everything's touching. <laughs> so I have a question for you. If that was your meeting that was so boring and serious, what would you do to wake it up, to shift the energy? Well, if I was leading that meeting, I think the energy would have started up probably, probably a bit differently. But, uh, you know, music is a really great way to aliven things up in the space. You got people, uh, you know, dancing, singing, um, even just as kind of an ambiance thing is a really great uh, type of thing. I, I think also the energy in a room in a lot of meetings is very, uh, uh, there's like one person in front. It's like a school, right? We kind of go into classroom mode and we kind of turn our blinders on and, you know, maybe it's going to, oh, hi, you know, it's kind of kind of where it stops. So uh, it's kind of it's kind of creating a space already that's more in a circular fashion the energy flows uh, more gently. It's maybe playing a couple games of, uh, to get people to connect actually together when they come in, you know, call them icebreaker things where, okay, go up and ask three people 
you know, what, what they love to do in life or what was their favorite thing to do when they were a kid, uh, you know, or walk up and ask something completely atypical to not what do you do? Where are you from? Um, you know, what kind of car did you drive up in? You know, not to say, again, it's like this utilitarian go right to the point. It's like, well, wait a minute. You know, for me, there's a lot of competent people in the world. Uh, that's not the reason that I'm going to work with them or I want to work with them or I'm compatible with them or that I like them or that I trust them or that I feel them with my gut and my instincts. And so it's kind of approaching things the way where we get to be able to connect more uh, on an energetic level and, uh, and maybe just kind of talking about different kinds of things the minute they actually come together. And I, I believe artistic expression is a really, really great way to do that. Food is a great also way to, to start. Obviously, a glass of wine or champagne when you walk in is always a great way to loosen everyone. You know, but also just kind of get people to kind of interact. It's almost like you go into a meeting, uh, if everyone suddenly sits down, not good. You should maybe have them like have a drink or snack, something standing like a cocktail party. Um, and kind of people need a little bit of guidance uh, you know, when they walk into a space to actually uh, you know, like if you set up a game or something to maybe get people to not spend too much time, maybe with one person, at least initially. Afterwards, you kind of gravitate maybe towards who you want, but make sure you go around and like say hi to everyone. You know, make sure you introduce yourself and, you know, but kind of try and find a way to say something like a little more original about yourself. Like, you know, it's like, hey, I'm David, you know, you know, if you came to dinner at my house, you would think that I was a professional chef. You know, people are like, they're like, who is this nut, right? But they laugh or something, and suddenly I've got a little emotion. I've got a little opening. They say, oh, this guy's kind of, this guy, we can kind of have a little fun with this guy. We can relax a little bit, you know, instead of being like totally like, you know, we're only here to do the utilitarian thing again. Got to bring more fun, more play, more joy to liberate our greatest energies. Because for me, that's the only way we get to this ultra performance thing together is, competence but if the joy is not there if the pleasure is not there if the sharing and the connection doesn't happen I mean, who cares really why are we, what are we doing here right i mean we, i mean i'm a little crazy about this but you know how many boring meetings boring speakers boring you know evenings boring cocktails boring meetings do we attend because people don't concentrate on the way that we connect you know how we connect versus the content, the what, uh, you know, this kind of stuff. I think sort of the way we connect, who we are connecting with, and to kind of scratch the surface a little, a little bit in a cagey way to, can we can get to know each other faster. I mean, that's really the way the hack is. Not this, oh, well, what do you know about? No, well, let's, let's go a little bit deeper. <laughs> All right, as we wind up here, I have one question before my final question that I just, I just have to ask. <laughs> what was your favorite thing to do when you were a kid? <laughs> <laughs> it certainly wasn't cooking, I'll tell you that. Uh, I really loved to roller skate. I had these four-wheel roller skates. And, you know, there was such a liberty in roller skating uh, where I grew up in Los Angeles. And it was like during the disco roller skating period, there were like roller rinks. And, you know, we'd go to Venice and do like disco dancing. And I even remember winning a, a roller skating race, which I shouldn't have won at all. I was like the smallest kid and, you know, but like the three guys in front of me like ran into each other around the last turn and fell oh. and like opened the way up and I went right in and won these great yellow wheels. And so there was like this sense of liberty, lots of body, physical, love that, speed, you know, a bit dangerous a little bit in a lot of ways. And I had like a, a gang, we all had t-shirts. And like, there were no rules. It was kind of like you jump off the curb and you're, you're skating like anywhere. I mean, it was just like this ultimate sense of, of freedom and abandonment and, uh, and super joy and, you know, very, very physical in a way though that's not like brutal, uh, you know, necessarily now. It certainly had a lot of accidents, but so roller skating was certainly tremendous tremendous joy for me that is a great Question. image i love thinking about that that sounds really fun <laughs> all right so as we wind up here i understand you have a pdf and a webinar to offer that our viewers to continue exploring this this question of aliveness yeah absolutely more than delighted so you can go to uh, davidbrow.com or alivefulness.com with one uh, l 
and you'll see right there on the, the front page, you can sign up for the, the daily Alive Fullness PDF, which is uh, free for you. And you'll see when you go into that page, actually at the bottom, there's a special sign up that I've only put up there for uh, the summit, uh, for the people coming from the summit to actually click on and get access to a webinar uh, about presence, about connection, uh, about awareness, about these types of things to actually live you know, this masterpiece of a life in a few steps, kind of how you can focus on things in a way that will, will help you lead your version of a masterpiece of a life, which involves a bit of this self-mastery, but then on the other side, there's a lot of connection and a lot of pleasure. So, so yeah, that's, that's the gift that I'm offering here for you today. Connection and pleasure. It sounds absolutely <laughs> glorious. Thank you so much, David. I really Thanks, appreciate it. It's been a, a really fun conversation. It's been a joy. Thank you. See you, everyone. <laughs>